<laughs> My name is Alexandre Gay and I welcome you to the second uh, Meco Life uh, workshop, which is a collaboration between Belgian, Belgian and Taiwanese philosopher about exploring question about causation mechanism in biology. And for the second workshop, we decided the Belgium team not to present in order to have more selected papers and invitation. And I have to say that you have to check regularly the, the program on the website. I did not program this website. I did not code this awful interface for the program. <laughs> but because unfortunately we had a ridiculously high number of last minute, uh, last minute uh, cancellation. So what I have to say about the, proceed, the proceeding of our workshop. So the people that do not have access to in your home, there's a, there's a paper in the entrance, so you have access to Wi-Fi if you want. Two, by default, we stream every talk on YouTube, and we put it on YouTube after. If you do not want to be on YouTube, please tell us, because the rule of our workshop and seminars, by default, we put everything on the way. But I'm very happy not to. Uh, but no, one we, button we that I should click. Totally fine. Don't, fine. Don't will, care. We will comply to European Union's rules if you do not want to have <laughs> complete control of your image. And seriously, uh, for the question too, we, we often put the question period too. If you do not want to appear on the web, you can say it and we will cut this part. That was the first. Three. We are a little bit, maybe it's our Nordic style or North American style. We like conference to go in time. <laughs> so before, five minutes before the end of your talk, because we want to have question period, I will put that in front of you. And if <laughs> by mistake you get to there, you have tried to finish. <laughs> Fourth. We have also a tradition in the Suffizes, and it's called, no, we're using the, the, the no bullying, bullying style. So, in Suffizes, we are non dogmatic. You can be continental, analytical, realist, unrealist. We don't care. We care about arguments, people developing their stuff. So, you can, we can have, you can critique someone else. You can be engaged, but the goal is the ultimate goal is to help other philosophers to do better things, so to have better opinions. So, especially in relation between senior and junior, there's not a lot of junior presenting in this workshop, but, but I will be particularly uh, attentive. How much attentive? Attentive to that kind of uh, power relations. I, I don't expect problems in this workshop, frankly, but. It happens, especially when we receive Americans. We are much more aggressive to join talks. So, without further delay, it is my honor and privilege to present the first talk, which will be uh, a plenary talk. So you have one hour maximum to present your before question. It is uh, Marcel Weber who will present to us uh, a talk called "Mechanism as Constituted by Activities." Well, first of all, <clears throat> I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to deliver this uh, plenary talk. It's a special pleasure to see some uh, friends from Taiwan again. Uh, so thank you very much for, for organizing this. So um, my topic will be um, one which you may have heard about, <laughs> mechanisms in the life sciences, a huge topic. And uh, I haven't um, said much about this topic in recent years. Uh, so this is an attempt to sort of um, uh, jump back into the discussion and um, offer um, some actually reflections on, on recent developments and also um, <coughs> a new proposal. Anyway, so uh, here's the plan for my uh, talk today. First, I will outline um, what the main questions are about mechanisms or more precisely a relationship called mechanistic constitution. Um, then I will talk about a, a traditional uh, criterion for mechanistic constitution which is due to Carl Kraber which is called mutual manipulability or MM and uh, this criterion has recently been 
replaced uh, by actually uh, Carl himself, together to himself with uh, Stuart Glennon and Mark Povich, um, a sort of a successor criterion for mutual manipulability, which is widely thought not to work. So uh, then I will offer some metaphysical um, reflections. So there's your ontic part <coughs> uh, about <coughs> um, construing mechanistic constitution as an apartheid, a myriological relation <coughs> between activities. And activities are conceived as metaphysically as occurrence. <coughs> then I will talk about um, how to intervene on activities. And then I will offer um, sort of um, sketch a new idea which um, I call the domain specificity of principles used to infer mechanistic constitution. So here, uh, just to um, bring us up to speed on the topic of mechanistic constitution, so what you see here is a um, um, abstract representation of a mechanism. This um, iconic uh, diagram is known as a Cra Kraber diagram after Carl Kraber who uh, invented it, and I think um, since they officially replaced it by something else, I'm, I'm going to miss it, I think, <laughs> because it has, it has so much shaped our uh, thinking, people's thinking about mechanisms for, for good or for worse. So the black dot on the bottom is supposed to represent a phenomenon, so it's something which happens, for example, a neuron firing, or a muscle contracting in, the bi in, a, in a biological organism. On the bottom, you see these small circles, which are some uh, things called entities uh, in the literature, but uh, I think they mean things, that um, are engaged in some activity. For example, the thing X is engaged in uh, phi oneing, etc. Uh, then you see uh, arrows and dotted lines. The arrows are supposed to represent causal relationship, relationship, relationships. So the activity of the things in a mechanism can affect each other causally. But in addition to this causal relationship, there is also, and this is represented by the dotted line, there is a, a relation called, um, well, there are different expression, just mechanistic constitution or constitutive relevance. This is supposed to be a non-causal relation, and it is, it's, it is supposed to be synchronic, um, as opposed to uh, causal relations which are thought to be diachronic. So this is the, the basic uh, picture, and the question that has uh, engaged people for, uh, I guess, about uh, two decades now, is how uh, we should think of this dotted line here. What is this constitutive re relevance or this me mechanistic constitution relation? And how can it be uh, ascertained? How can it be proven or established? <coughs> um, it is important to distinguish different questions about mechanistic constitution. So um, with um, Craver, Glennon and Povich, uh, I think we uh, should um, <coughs> respect this uh, threefold distinction of questions. There are namely conceptual questions, in particular the question, what exactly does mechanistic constitution mean? So it's a question about um, the, the, the meaning or the content of this, of this con concept. Then there, is, uh, there are epistem epistemological questions, namely what should count as evidence for the presence of mechanistic constitution relations? or also perhaps something stronger proof, so something like decisive evidence, or an evidence that is sufficient to establish a claim about uh, constitutive relevance. And thirdly, there are metaphysical questions, such as what are the truth makers for claims of mechanistic constitution? And I will be speaking today mostly about the first two questions, but also um, <coughs> about, about the third. Although I will not address directly the question of truth makers, but maybe indirectly. Anyway, so in his original proposal from 2007, Carl Craver pro pro um, proposed a sort of a operational criterion for um, detecting 
uh, constitutive relevance, and this is known as um, mutual manipulab manipulability. So Craver argued that there are two types of experiment experiments that are used in research uh, looking for mechanisms, in particular in uh, neuroscience, but also elsewhere. There are um, experiments where um, scientists intervene bottom up, which means they intervene on the constituent, on the constituents, on the components of a mechanism, and then they detect some change in the phenomenon. So, for, ex for example, they intervene um, um, in, in a neuron, an individual neuron, and then they observe a change that, that happens uh, in the whole organism or in the um, subsystem under, under study. The second type of experiment is a top-down experiment where, um, according to uh, Carl, um, scientists intervene on the phenomenon itself and then they observe or detect a change at the level of the components of a mechanism. So for example, in a, neuro, in a uh, neuroscientific experiments, uh, subjects may be asked to um, memorize a word or to think about something or to visualize something uh, which is sort of intervening on the whole phenomenon of, of cognitive uh, processes. And then something is observed in the brain. Some, some neural circuit, circuits light, light up in the MRI or, or whatever um, method is used. And um, Craver proposed that uh, if both, um, if a component which is implicated in a um, me mechanism um, uh, uh, satisfy both of these requirements, which means it um, can be manipulated bottom up, but it can also be manipulated top down. This is sufficient for establishing constitutive relevance. This idea has been has received much criticism in the literature. <coughs> so many people have um, questioned the uh, the whole um, idea of a top down manipulation. And I think perhaps the most rigorous uh, sort of objection uh, or, if you want, proof of the incoherence of this notion is due to uh, Michael Baumgartner, Alexander Gebharter and Lorenzo Cassini. Uh, you can find this in, in, in these two papers. So uh, here is their way of uh, sort of uh, cutting out the problem. So on the top you see Psi which is supposed to represent a phenomenon to be explained by the identification of a mechanism. And you see that uh, there is an inter intervention variable um, um, which um, targets specifically psi. Then there are further inter intervention variables, uh, i phi 3, i phi 2, i phi 1, which uh, directly target um, constitu constituents or components of the mechanisms which are uh, some entity, some object, something which is doing something. So phi y, for example, could be a neuron firing, an individual neuron firing or something like that. And then you could directly intervene on this neuron with, uh, with an electrode, for example. And here you also see, um, uh, again, the, the arrows mean, cause, mean causal relations. So the interventions are basically uh, causes. And then you see uh, the dotted lines, which are constitutive. Uh, relations, and these are just um, the possible interventions that are uh, at stake here. Now, um, Baumgartner and uh, Gebharter have proposed the following reductio uh, argument, um, um, purporting to show the incoherence of the idea that you could intervene uh, on the whole of a phenomenon, and then uh, with respect to some of its component, uh, such as um, to, uh, in order to um, um, verify a relation of um, constitutive relevance. So they suppose uh, that uh, I psi were an ideal intervention variable on psi with respect to phi i. So uh, here, this is I psi. Um, it's, uh, um, supposed to be, so this is a su supposition, um, an ideal intervention variable with respect to those components phi, phi uh, i uh, to 3. 
Then, according <coughs> to uh, interventionist theory, this implies that psi, uh, I psi is a cause of both psi and the components phi. This leaves us, uh, according to Baumgartner and Gebhardter, with three possibilities. Either um, I psi causes psi, which causes phi i, or uh, I, I psi causes phi i, which causes psi, or I psi is a common cause of psi and um, phi i. So there are th th these, these three options and none of these three options uh, could uh, count as a ideal experiment on um, the uh, activity psi with respect to its component activities. Um, Bangar and Gebhardt argue that the first option is impossible uh, because phi i are supposed to be spatiotemporal parts of psi i, and, uh, which means if they're spatiotemporal parts, they cannot stand in a causal relation. The second possibility works, but it's not a top-down intervention. It's a bottom-up intervention. Now, the third possibility contradicts the supposition because it's supposed to be an ideal intervention, which means it's supposed to be surgical, surgical with respect to the components, which means it should um, manipulate only that component and no off-track off components, which means that components which are not on a causal path between the two. But this is not satisfied here. If it is a common cause of psi and phi, we have um, a, contra um, a contradiction to the supposition. <coughs> this uh, intervention is not surgical or ideal. It is fat-handed. So it, it manipulates two components at the same time. Therefore, Baumgartner and Gebhardt conclude that the notion of a top-down intervention or ideal top-down intervention is incoherent. Now enter uh, this recent paper by Craver, Glennon, and Povich. Now, I read them as accepting the incoherence argument, although I'm not entirely sure if they really accept it or if they uh, just defend the ma mutual manipulability criterion in a somewhat modified way. But anyway, uh, they officially announce that the MM criterion is to be replaced by a different but related, according to them, criterion, uh, which they called matched interlevel experiment, or MIE. So here's the new picture. Uh, now mechanisms are represented like this. You have a series of activities which sequentially act and in total uh, form a process uh, which takes the system from input condi conditions psi in to output conditions psi out. Now, for simplicity, uh, this is depicted in a sequential manner, but they indicate that mechanisms could also be non-sequential, so they could branch or join or whatever. Um, so this is the new way of representing mechanisms, and the new way of uh, experiment of establishing constitutive relevance relations. So now we are talking about deciding whether or not some of these activities represented as a circle is actually part of the whole activity of phi. So this uh, has to be established again by uh, three types actually of experiments. Bottom up inhibitory experiments where you uh, intervene on a component activity such to inhibit it and observe an inhibition of the um, whole process. Or there, is, uh, there are bottom up excitatory experiments where you activate one uh, component activity and then observe um, the uh, process um, and uh, increase in the activity of the whole process. And then the third um, is supposed to replace the old top-down uh, intervention. Um, now, what, uh, how they describe it is uh, you intervene on the input conditions and then um, observe a change in the components of the phenomenon, the mechanistic phenomenon, and in particular, um, you will be looking for uh, changes that uh, are of the same kind as and occur with quantitatively overlapping ranges with the activity psi de de detected in top-down experiments. So, um, um, 
you need to observe the right kind of dependence between an intervention on the uh, uh, input and the, the kind of change you observe. So it, it somehow has to be proportionate, quantitatively uh, uh, proportionate to the output. So now I must say that I'm um, practically totally on board, so this is constructive work with this proposal. So what I'm going to suggest, uh, what I'm going to present are um, perhaps hopefully some further clarifications of point that, points that are maybe not entirely clear in the proposal. And also, um, I think I, we need to qualify um, the method. And I think this will also not particularly, um, or we, we will to have to qualify this account in a way which is not necessarily uh, opposed to uh, Cravers, Glennon's and Povich's proposal. I haven't discussed it with them yet, but um, I see no reason why they should necessarily disagree with what I um, will offer. So um, let us step, step back on the traditional accounts of mechanisms and um, note that they do seem to, con to posit, uh, because they uh, posit things and activities, both at the same time as constituents of mechanisms, uh, it seems that there are two distinct kinds of myriological relations in a mechanism. There are parthood relations between a mechanism, or sometimes a system S, and some things uh, Xi, and then there is another myriological relation, or set of myriological relations, between a phenomenon Psi and the components, uh, component activities Phi I. And, um, well, one thing to notice is that the S has disappeared here. There's no longer a system. So if S once was something which is, was composed from other things, perhaps a continuant composed from other con continuants, which means thing like uh, objects or entities, that has disappeared. It's no longer in the picture. And I think that's right. That's a good move. So I think the right view, and this is very much inspired by a paper by Murray Kaiser and Beate Krickel. Um, so I think the right way of um, conceiving the constitutive relevance relation is as follows. We we'll first uh, think of explanandum phenomena uh, as complex processes. Complex meaning as opposed to simple, so meaning they're composed of other processes. In fact, uh, processes or activities, I will not systematically distinguish here between processes and activities. Now these complex processes may involve things or not. I think the things are not necessary, especially since um, many philosophers of biology have uh, gone um, into process metaphysics, process ontology, thinking that uh, traditional things or continuance um, can be dispensed with in biology. It's processes all the way down, so we don't uh, really need them. And um, I'm not, not necessarily, uh, don't necessarily want to defend a process ontology, but I think uh, that uh, an account of mechanisms should be flexible enough to account for uh, mechanisms that contain uh, things and um, uh, such uh, mechanisms that don't. Now, the, 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 the second move is to uh, construe constitutive, constituent activities of these complex processes as spatio-temporal parts of such processes. So, the constitutive relevance uh, relation is just a parthood relation, nothing else. And it's a parthood relation that obtains between processes and activities, which are occurrence. So they are extended in time, they have temporal parts. Now just <coughs> for, for illustration, consider a Swiss watch like this one. Um, we, say, we could say that the springs and wheels from which the watch is made are spatial parts of the watch. The watch is a continuant, or you can be construed as a continuant. And the springs and wheels that make up the watch are also continuants. And then there is a a uh, relation of spatial parthood between these continuants. However, the mechanism is quite a different thing. The mechanism, 
consists, uh, so that's the phenomenon, so that's the, the watch showing the time, that's the phenomenon. And that is composed of the motions of the spring and wheels. So it's what these springs and wheels in the watch do, which composes or constitutes the mechanism. So the phenomenon is extended in time, it has temporal parts, so are the motions of uh, the springs and wheels in the watch. So um, the phenomenon is a process which is um, constituted by motions or activities and those are occurrence. And the, re the, the constitutive relevance relation is a, rela a parted relation among occurrence. Um, whether we also have continuous, continuous, like in the case of this watch, this is an open question. We might not have them in all mechanisms. But in all mechanisms, we, ha we will have this kind of partridge relations between phenomena and activities. So the springs and wheels constitute the watch. Their motions constitute the phenomenon. We could say that the mechanism is the set of constitutive motions and their spatial temporal arrangement. And um, even though sometimes things or continuants do figure in descriptions of a mechanism, uh, the constitutive uh, relations hold between the motions, between the activities. So this is just for illustration. Now I want to think about uh, what it means to, what it could mean to intervene on activities. Uh, if the picture I just presented is right, intervening on an activity means intervening on a temporally extended occurrence. So you're not intervening uh, on a thing, you're intervening on an occurrence. Now interventions are themselves occurrence, which is as it should be. Uh, they can be conceived of either as events or as processes. Uh, themselves and their temporal dimension, which means so their their exact their exact timing, the moment of uh, at which they occur, at the moment of, uh, at which they or the moment at which they begin, and how long they last can make a difference with respect to the outcome. So so sometimes exposing a cell to a growth factor for a longer period of time can can have a larger effect or actually annihilate the, the uh, initial of effect. So duration, timing and duration is of the essence very often. Um, so what about, um, what could it mean to intervene top down on an activity? So it's clear what it could mean to intervene bottom up, which it means we intervene on a component and observe something uh, in the phenomenon. But what about those, um, top-down intervention. We could ask if the baumgartner gebhardter Cassinio reductio argument applies um, to intervention conceived as temporally bound occurrence acting on other occurrence. And I think they would say yes, as long as, so long as there are spatial temporal, temporal overlaps between the phenomenon and the, com the components, the argument goes through because it relies on um, any uh, dependence of the part on the whole not being causal. And if there is a spatial temporal over overlap um, between two elements, um, according to ent interventionist theory, uh, it's not a causal dependency. So the, the, the reductio goes through as, as, as long as there is this kind of spatial temporal overlap. Now, Craver, Glennon, and Povich <coughs> try to solve this problem, um, the, and this is my sort of analysis of what they're doing. What, what they're doing is they separate psi conceptually from the constitu uh, constitutive activities by identifying the phenomenon with input and output conditions. So they have replaced the old version of the top-down intervention which used to be as follows, in the conditions relevant to the request for explanation, there is some change to S's sighing that changes X's phying. So that was the old top-down um, intervention requirement for constitutive relevance. And that gets reinterpreted or replaced by, now uh, bring about start-up conditions sighing, 
measure excess phi in, also measure psi out, so the uh, output conditions, evaluate thereby whether uh, x and its phi are changed when psi in produces psi out. So what, what, what happens is that they add a fourth possibility to Baumgartner and Gebhardt's three options. So according to Baumgartner and Gebhardt, a top-down intervention variable would either have to uh, intervene on psi, which then uh, causes phi i, or um, uh, it would have to be uh, bottom-up, or it would have to be a common cause. Now, um, Craver, Glennon, and Povich add a fourth possibility, namely, which is to uh, intervene on psi in, on the input, co input conditions of the mechanism, then observe some change in excess phi in, and a change in um, the output conditions psi out. So this is a perfectly fine, according to them, uh, causal graph. And there's no violation here of any uh, requirements of causal graph theory in particular, there is nothing that spatiotemporally overlaps here because you intervene um, as it were before the mechanism um, unfolds. So uh, they seem to um, now uh, are left with this. They have the mechanism being that set of changes that occur between the input and output uh, events or processes, which means basically, basically that the phenomenon is, as it were, uh, it doesn't contain the mechanism, right? And this actually has been criticized by Marie Kaiser and Beate Krickel in their um, paper, The Metaphysics of Constitutive Mechanistic Phenomena, they argue that this move obliterates the distinction between, between etiological and constitutive mechanisms, which is, uh, used to be part and parcel of the new mechanistic doctrine. So you, have, you can have etiological mechanisms where you just, just have a series of um, um, steps which depend on each other causally, and you have constitutive mechanisms uh, where you have this uh, part-whole uh, kind of uh, relation. Now, I'm not sure whether etiological mechanisms can be um, retained in the new picture. Um, I, just, I think this needs to be discussed. discussed. But in any case, um, it is clear that this view doesn't allow to be the mechanism to be temporally contained in the phenomenon, which is not consistent with the view that phenomena are mereological sums of mechanistic components. Because if they are, then the mechanism would then have to, would have to be spatial temporally contained in the explanatum phenomenon. So uh, Kaiser and Crickle think that this is the right way of uh, depicting the relationship between uh, a phenomenon and the mechanism. It's spatial temporal containment. Now, I think this is correct, and I think it seems to me. Craver, Glennon, and Povich are also committed to it. So we would, will have to conclude that in, on the new picture, the excitatory top-down interventions do not intervene on the phenomenon itself, but rather on the conditions obtaining before the process begins, or perhaps at the moment where the process begins. So the top-down intervention trigger or initiates the process such, at, such that at it can be observed. And typically, it will be observed in this type of experiment in vivo. Not necessarily, but typically. So let us consider um, this question of, um, well, what do um, these top-down excitatory interventions uh, actually do? On an example, and I'm going to use um, also the example, the main example used in the um, <coughs> CGP paper. Uh, which is a, uh, an example from neuroscience, from the neuroscience of the nematode uh, Ceneroptitis elegans. And the behavior in question is a withdrawal effect shown uh, by uh, these nematode worms when you lightly tap them on the head. 
So when you, when you tap a worm on the head, it will do two things. It will stop uh, heat wiggling its head. And nematodes like to wiggle their heads. So all the time they, they do this, they, they wiggle their heads. When you tap them on the head, they will stop the wiggling and they will with, withdraw. So they will make a backward movement. And this is shown here. So here you, you, you see the, 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 the worm <coughs> wiggling its head. Then a touch is delivered to the head. The wiggling stops and the, the, the worm uh, sort of withdraws. And then after it has turned, uh, it will resume the head. Now, the function of this behavior is actually quite um, scary. <laughs> it's, 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 it's eerie. So the, the, the function of this mechanism is probably to uh, a, def a defense mechanism against a predatory fungus. Yes, there are predatory fungi. And what they do, they build um, ring-like structures. So the fungus builds uh, rings which traps nematodes. So a, a, a nematode, which is unfortunate enough to swim in, into such a ring, will be trapped. Now this reflex probably allows the worm <coughs> to escape from this trap. And the first thing you want to do when you want to withdraw from being trapped in a ring is you want to stop wiggling your head, because otherwise you will, you will not get out. So you, you, will, you want to stop wiggling your head and then withdraw. And this is what the worm does when you tap it on the head. So probably that stimulus touch on the head is, uh, will be activated uh, when the nematode is trapped in a, in a fungal ring. <coughs> and this complex set of behavioral responses then ensues. Now to the right, you see um, a neural circuit, which um, presumably represents uh, the mechanism uh, that explains this phenomenon. And it nicely actually corresponds to the different phases. Um, so here on top, you have a sensory neuron. So that responds to a touch, to a mechanical uh, signal. Uh, by activating uh, these uh, control uh, neurons, these command neurons, and they activate this motor neuron here um, by um, <coughs> secreting the neurotransmitter tyramine. <clears throat> so this is a tyramine-sensitive motor neuron. And what it does, it relaxes the neck muscles. So the wiggling of the head will stop. And also, these um, command neurons will activate motor neurons uh, that cause muscle contractions, so rhythmic muscle contractions and rel relaxations on the other side. So to, to move backwards, the worm will um, uh, contract muscles on one side of the body and relax muscles on the other side and then reverse. So this will make, will make this wiggling motion. And this is controlled by these motor neurons. <coughs> now, um, what kind of experiments were actually used by neuroscientists when unraveling these mechanisms? So, uh, one of the first um, experiments uh, or one of the central experiments, I'm not sure if it was chronologically first, is exogenous tyramine application. So just um, adding tyramine to the growth medium, uh, to the growth surface for, of, of the worm. This leads, this immobilizes the worms. So if in the presence of tyramine, uh, they cannot move. Now genetic studies show that uh, there are mutants, uh, in particular SER2, which is deleted for a signaling protein, a G protein, um, that these mutants are unresponsive to tyramine. So they don't, um, they are not immobilized in the presence of tyramine. But tyramine sensitivity is restored if uh, the, the gene is delivered as a transgene. So the defective gene is, is, is as it were, replaced by a um, functional copy of the gene, then tyramine sensitivity is restored. There are other mutants in the G protein signaling pa pathway which have similar effects, like SER2. Neuroscientists did expression studies. So um, they observed where the SER2 gene is active, and it was shown to be active um, in head muscles. 
spe specifically in cholinergic and GABAergic uh, motor neurons, which are responsible uh, for the <coughs> muscle uh, effects. So um, other neurotransmitter inhibitors were used <coughs> um, so other substances with known effects also have um, can inhibit these responses. Uh, scientists did laser ablation studies on various neurons. So uh, they targeted uh, specific neurons uh, in the worm, in the uh, central system, nervous system, and um, obliterating individual neurons by laser beams and um, observing what kinds of parts of the process uh, were <coughs> um, disappeared. Finally, um, optogenetic studies were conducted where uh, neuroscientists um, selectively expressed light-sensitive ion channels in specific neurons. So this is a, a very in, in, intriguing technique where um, light-sensitive uh, ion channels like channel rhodopsin are expressed in uh, the membrane of neurons and then activated by light. And when uh, these cha channel, rhodopsin, uh, channel rhodopsins can be um, uh, controlled by light flashes, so this is a way of specifically activating uh, specific neurons. And this all, as it were, all these findings uh, were then used in order to construct <coughs> this neural circuit diagram. So this, uh, these various uh, connections here, which are inhibitory and um, excitatory uh, relations, were um, discovered with these, with these experiments, these kinds of studies. Now, most of these experiments, I think, can be understood as um, straightforward bottom-up interventions, trying to determine if changing in activity changes the phenomenon. So you immobile, uh, uh, you add tyrosine, which inactivates uh, the motor neuron, which immob immobilizes the worm. Um, you um, take out a neuron with a laser beam and observe that some part of the process no longer occurs. So these are bottom-up uh, um, interventions. But I would like to highlight the importance of, exp of experiments trying to localize activities. So um, it's not only important what happens when you wiggle at some point, it's also important where it happens. I think this is crucial information when constructing a mechanism. And this has, I think, not been uh, sufficiently acknowledged in the, in the literature. So I think that um, not only the kind and quantity of activities must match as required by the new um, uh, matched interlevel experiment criterion, but also their spatio-temporal location di and dynamics. So the effects uh, observed by the various interventions must show the right dynamics and they must occur in the, in the right places. So what, how should we think of these activation experiments? And according to um, Craver, Glennon and Povich, the top-down experiment is basically the touch on the worm's head. That's a top-down experiment because it activates the whole process that's what it does. And mm, I suggest that um, we change our interpretation of what such activation experiments do. I think they should not be viewed as um, uh, interventions designed to test for constitutive relevance at all, no matter whether bottom up or top down. I suggest to uh, construe these experiments as some kind of a preparate, uh, preparative intervention, uh, the purpose of which is to produce and exhibit the phenomenon you want to study. I mean, here, the phenomenon doesn't occur when you don't tap the head, the, the worm on the head. And uh, so produce and exhibit, here I'm missing a word in English, the German word darstellen is very nice because it can mean represent, but also um, produce. So um, a very nice uh, verb, which you don't have, neither in uh, English nor in French. So um, 
the, the, exper the idea is the, that the experiment, the, the, the goal of the experiment is, as it were, to um, make the system manifest the phenomenon uh, by um, um, changing uh, the input conditions or the initial conditions of the experiment in such a way that the phenomenon will actu actually occur. I think it's this type of experiment and it, it's what it does, it, it prepares the system for the experiment. So that's why I call it a preparative intervention. <coughs> so <coughs> what about mechanistic constitution? How can we um, get a sufficient proof, as it were, a sufficient criterion for mechanistic constitution. Uh, assuming that all bottom-up interventions um, will not uh, be sufficient, in particular, they will also lead to things showing up which we, will, which we do not want to be part of the mechanism. So um, my um, take on this is that it has been a mistake in the literature to think that there is a domain neutral sufficient criterion for mechanistic uh, constitution. I do not think there is such a criterion, neither epistemo epistemologically nor metaphysically. It is my view that not all processes that are accessible to mechanistic explanation are decomposable into constitutively relevant activities in the same, same way. In various domains of the life sciences and other sciences as well, perhaps, uh, there are criteria for piecing together uh, mechanisms. In particular, there are different criteria for the connectedness of activities such that they uh, produce a phenomenon. So, for example, in the worm withdrawal example um, that I have just discussed, Scientists use principles for constructing neural circuits. So these are very specific methods used for reconstructing, uh, for mapping neural circuits. And only these principles um, are sufficient for deciding on constitutive relevance. Bottom-up interventions can be helpful. Um, the alleged top-down interventions um, are clearly necessary, but in order to really establish um, whether uh, some component uh, its activity is uh, part of a process, <coughs> you need methods or principles that are specific to the domain. So in biochemistry, for us to give another example, there are principles for mapping or constructing metabolic pathways, which means there are specific, specific methods for um, mapping metabolic pathways, but there are also um, principles um, on the theoretical level uh, that are um, that determine um, whether um, two uh, activities um, <coughs> jointly form a process. In developmental biology, we could mention principles for mapping gene regulatory networks and so on. So my hypothesis, <clears throat> and this will have to be confirmed by further work, my hypothesis is that in, in various domains of science you have different principles uh, for um, proving constitutive relevance. There's no domain neutral method. In contrast to causal reasoning, so I think causal reasoning is the only domain neutral uh, method here. Now each of these uh, principles comes with its own methods for piecing together or mapping mechanisms um, and uh, their activities. So for example in neuroscience you have electrophysiological recordings or optogenetics as being uh, salient methods. Uh, in biochemistry, uh, radioactive tracer methods, enzyme inhibi inhibitors, excuse me. Now, of course, some of these experimental methods are used for uh, quasi-ideal interventions to test for causal relations. And here the principles of causal uh, reasoning are uh, pertinent. Uh, but there are also um, 
um, I contend um, methods for ascertaining constitutive relevance, which are not domain neutral, unlike causal reasoning. So here are my conclusions. I think we should answer the conceptual question, what is or what does it mean to say that um, <coughs> two things are related by constitutive re relevance. Uh, it just means parthood as applied to processes. So it's a muriological relation, conceptually, it's a muriological relation between occurrence. So uh, mechanistic activities are nothing but perhaps essential spatiotemporal parts of processes. Essential, that's, that's just a, a, a hypothesis. I, I have no um, good way, uh, sort of argument for establishing. I just have a hunch that they will turn out to be essential parts of processes. Now, the good way of answering the epistemological questions is as follows. Bottom-up experiments can provide evidence for mechanistic constitution, basically using domain-neutral causal reasoning principles. But, as I have argued, such evidence needs to be complemented with domain-specific uh, data, methodological principles, and constraints. Uh, for example, uh, such principles uh, connected to um, the uh, mapping of neural circuits, metabolic pathways, gene regulatory networks, etc. Now, the so-called activation or top-down experiments, uh, I think, are important, but we uh, better understand them as basically just um, um, preparatory uh, interventions that are um, supposed, the purpose of which is uh, the production of the phenomenon such that it can be observed, measured, experimented on. Finally, um, and I haven't argued for this uh, here, but I, I think also that the truth maker, so the, the metaphysical questions about truth maker, I think the truth makers for claims of constitutive relevance also depend on the kind of process studies. studies. So there, I don't think there's a, um, an universal um, theory um, of the truth makers of uh, constitutive relevance relation. Um, I think that we should be ontological pluralists about what individuates processes and also about what might constitute uh, a natural decomposition of a process into parts, which is what um, mechanisms are. Thank you very much for your attention. Plenty of time for questions or comments. Um, I wonder if you are familiar with this um, philosopher, I, I'm not, I'm not pronouncing her name wrong, it's um, Lina Kasterner? Le, Lina, L-E-N-A, Kasterner, C-A-S-T-N-E-R. No, sorry. Yeah, okay, but I can send you the, the, the Yes. Form. So she has this uh, notion called mere interaction, mm -hmm. which is the idea that uh, not every, um, um, experiment is about like um, investigating the mechanism. Some experiment about intervention is about like uh, uh, changing something so that you can produce and exhibit like that mm -hmm. similar uh, similar to your preparatory pre pre intervention. But right. I, I feel there. So I just wondering if you familiar with the, her work and maybe there's some. Uh, yeah, you have thought about the the the, the sameness of si the similarity or difference mm -hmm. between her concept and your your concept. Because she, when she pr proposed this idea, she, I think she wants to um, show that there are like um, part of the um, scientific practice that is not captured by the mechanism um, discussion, and that's why she coined this term. But in your pre pre preparatory intervention. It's still in the in the overall magnus framework, and you want to um, highlight that the top down top down type of mm -hmm. experiments. Maybe we we'll better understand this this type of 
yeah, I'm still trying to figure out whether the, you guys are go, like saying the different thing or saying the same thing in different ways. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd be very happy to, uh, to read this paper. This, yeah, yeah. this, this sounds like uh, uh. Could be could be related. But you see, this happens a lot. The, the the literature on mechanisms is so vast by now that uh, um, it happens a lot. That um, um, well, I, I certainly cannot read it all that. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and the the second follow up question is uh, more on this um, preparatory intervention. So yes, um, you. You talk more about in in, in vivo uh, experiments, so I wonder, like in, in virtual or even simulation type of experiment, because mm -hmm. um, my case. So I you mean in, in silico? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and the uh, also maybe just brain size. Um, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not like the animal in in actual moving environment. So maybe let's just talk about simulation using computer. Um, so in that case, um. um I, just, I wonder that uh, whether you will treat that as a, a, a also an example of what you call preparatory intervention mm -hmm. in the simulation experiment. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I got the um, in my case study. I the neuroscientists they collect the uh, neural data and they input those data into computer model and simulate uh, neural mm -hmm. network and they perform some intervention. Um, on the uh, on the network is similar based on the data, and so that kind of that kind of intervention is would you call that kind of as a also kind of um, preparatory intervention in your sense? Yeah, or maybe simulations of interventions. <laughs> so I mean, I, I I totally agree that um, uh, computer simulations um, are used in um, discovering mechanisms not only in uh, neuroscience, also in genetics, in developmental biology, so uh, work on um, gene regulatory networks, I think Charles is interested in this. Um, so uh, they, they run simulations of these, of, of, of these networks. And um, I think sim simulations indeed can be part of those methods that are used in a particular domain, in a, in a particular way, to establish uh, constitutive relations in, in, in mechanisms, so that that's totally uh, can be totally <coughs> part of the method. Now, with respect with respect to experiments, now there has there has been much discussion as to whether uh, in silico experiments are actually experiments. And so that that's how they're called in mm -hmm. in, in, in biology. Right? And I don't have a, a view about. I don't really have a view about this. It, it only seems to me that when you look at what, what is done in such simulation studies, very often uh, you see um, manipulations, let me put this neutrally, uh, so, or you see um, moves that are made by the scientists that could be described as here they are simulating an experiment. They're not only simulating the <coughs> system, they're simulating the experiment. So, for example, they have in their equations that they have a term for the calcium concentration. And then they will, in the simulation, um, run the simulation with different values for the calcium, in, in the initial values for the calcium con con concentration. And to me, this looks like now they're simulating experiments. <coughs> they're, as it were, um, Trying to determine what would happen <laughs> if 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 um, the target system were like the simulation and you added calcium to the system, what would happen? So, <laughs> so it's yeah, I, I would say it's it's kind of factual indeed, but uh, it can provide it can provide evidence uh, uh, absolutely. Um, so um, I, I I have not, no problem with that, but I, I think I would call it a simulated intervention or a simulated experiment. Rather than, a rather than an intervention or an experiment. Okay. Okay. Caleb? Okay. Caleb, yeah, that's me. Caleb, <laughs> Caleb sorry. No, no worries. Okay, no worries. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the objection to mutual manipulability. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I confess I'm not up to date on that on this literature. So, um, uh, so apologies if um, you know, I'm asking you to explain something that somebody else has already put in print. But um, it, it seems a bit odd to me that um, that Craver and Glennon and Povich are compelled by this objection that if you were to say wiggle uh, psi, then you would wiggle an off-path causal variable at the level of phi. Reason is because so so Jim Woodward has has responded to this Baum Gardner sort of style of objection, and I think compellingly, right? Um, and he says, well, look, it's just not. Uh, we just can't treat this kind of relationship as the kind of relationship that is represented on a causal graph. Um, we use arrows here, but really, uh, if we have this sort of synchronic dependence between the upper level and the lower level, then that 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 um, that path of manipulation is not a causal one. So if we are wiggling a variable at the higher level, holding everything else fixed, and we see a corresponding wiggle at the lower level, well, that's not a causal relationship, right? Otherwise, we're kind of begging the question against mutual manipulability. So I wonder why. Yeah. So so so. so what is the force there? Uh, well, why can't we just say, well, yes, we should not read that arrow as a causal arrow? So, um, you mean in the argument? Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, the first, um, the first possibility here. Mm -hmm. uh, read the second arrow as as not non-causal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you explain to me what this is supposed to be again? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So psi is uh, represents the um, phenomenon. So that's the phenomenon to be explained. And phi represents the activity of um, the mechanistic constituents that are responsible for this phenomenon. Does that, does that help? I. Oh, that's an intervention variable. So that's. The big I. The small I is that there's a lot of components. <laughs> so the I is, is an intervention variable. So it means uh, it's an, an in, that's the wiggling part. <laughs> the wiggling part. Yeah. Please. Sorry. Uh, well, just, yes, exactly. So, uh, so Woodward says this, and also. Um, Elliot Silver and Larry Shapiro say this uh, in another article where they talk about Jaguan Kim's um, mm -hmm. uh, causal exclusion argument. You know, they say, look, if you wiggle, uh, if you wiggle a, a, a supervening variable, then it just seems conceptually kind of weird to talk about a corresponding wiggle in the supervenient space as a causal relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, I guess. Taking the principles of the interventionist theory, just basically uh, literally, mm -hmm. and um, I think Baumgarten, like like other people, Bad Leridan, for example, have argued. Well, that's that's what that's what follows from the theory. You, yeah. you, you can't just say um, this is not causal. Where right after you you have is uh, put forward the theory that says that when you wiggle something, yeah. uh, then, uh, so you, 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 you would have sort of to, um, and I think now, Wood, Woodward does this recently, right? He yes, says, he, <coughs> he says um, that uh, the <coughs> definitional and supervenience relations uh, are uh, excluded, explici explicitly excluded from, yeah. from, from the theory. Yeah. Um, I guess, um, the people who um, buy this argument find this move ad hoc. That's um, just, motivi just motivated by um, the uh, desire of, of, of keeping these top-down interventions. And I, I, th I think this is how Bert Luridan argues. And um, 
I'm not sure. I was surprised to see that they're actually buying the argument. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they do. I mean, the, 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 the paper has, as it were, it has two phases. One phase is, okay, we, we, we totally get it. There are no top-down interventions. Uh, let's sort of um, modify, let's get rid of them and uh, propose a new criterion. And then, and then it comes the MIE. That's how, that's one reading of the paper. Another reading is, um, no, we don't buy the argument as such. We will show you how these interventions that, as they are, were originally conceived by Craver, uh, how they can be made sense of. Yeah. And maybe it's, it's, it's a bit of both. I'm not, I'm, I'm, it's, it, it's a bit um, sort of, um, It has. It, it is a bit Janus faced. <laughs> yes. In this, in this way, and, and I must say, I haven't had a chance to discuss it with them yet. But but anyway, I I, I guess this is. This would be the, the the response of the defenders of this argument yeah. to to this move. Yeah. yeah. Can I just have a quick follow up? So I think that's right. I think then what the defender of Woodward might say in that situation is well. The, we, the way I can wiggle out of it, wiggle, wiggle out of it being called ad hoc, mm -hmm. right, is to say that the corresponding uh, variation is synchronic. And so if mechanisms require causal relationships to be diachronic, if I'm holding everything else fixed and I wiggle the, the higher variable and a lower level variable corresponds, then I've got a synchronic relationship and now, you know, now I've restored mutual manipulability. Um, I, I mean, I'm prima facie compelled by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think this concerns in particular a, a relation which we should properly describe as phiing at t mm -hmm. and sighing at t. Mm -hmm. Now that's not a relationship between um, a process and activities mm -hmm. as a whole. It's, as it were, a time slice. Mm -hmm. And when, if you indeed have um, constitutive relation between these time slices, and I think this ought to be the case according to the metaphysical picture, you ought to have such relations. So synchronic constitutive relations between occurrence. Mm -hmm. Now here, the metaphysic does get a bit um, blurry, <laughs> I must say. But in, in, in any case, uh, in this case, you have a synchronic relation and the argument applies. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking, well, what about if you don't consider uh, the activity at some time point, but over a longer duration, which means that you could have diachronic uh, relations. So you wiggle the process at some time point t, and then you observe what happens later. Then the, 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 at least the, the synchronicity problem would be gone. But I think Baumgartner, Gebhardt, and Cassini would still say, well, if it's, it doesn't matter if it's not synchronic. If it's a part, you can't um, it's not admissible as a causal pathway. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm buying this yet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there might be something interesting going on here, but I, I, I haven't been able to, 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 to get this point clear for me. Um, so that's, that, that's something I, um, I'm, I'd, I'd like to think about more and, and, and talk about more. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a, I, think, I think it might, might turn out to be a, an interesting point. What, what, what my puzzlement is, well, suppose you intervene um, at a process at an earlier time and then observe at the, at the lower level what happens later. Now, in what sense have you really intervened top down then? Uh, if you haven't changed the whole process, but only a part of it, haven't you just intervened on a part? <coughs> and then it's not top down. So, so I guess this is, this is uh, part of the, the puzzlement, of my puzzlement here. But I think there there's some there might be some interesting discoveries there uh, of a, of a metaphysical conceptual kind <laughs> lying in wait. Mm -hmm.
this was really cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, you're 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 right that I'm interested in nearby things. So I'm going to ask a question that that I think well, you'll you'll understand. You'll you'll see why I'm asking. Um, but I do really, in general, I really like this move to making the the, the constitution criteria domain specific, uh, the top down kind of the top down criteria a, a bit more domain domain specific, and sort of taking on the ontological pluralism that kind of comes along comes along with that. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are though on so, so it, it strikes me that once you once you make that pluralistic step, right? Um, if everything doesn't wind up cashed out in the same kind of domain independent causal currency, um, then we want to start thinking presumably about something like adequacy criteria for these different ways in which to parcel out uh, a big process into little processes, if you will. And I wonder what you think about, I mean, is the, you could just be pragmatic here, right, and say that the proof of the pudding is, is in the eating and, you know, if whatever neuroscience works well parceling out processes in manner X, so that sort of gives a stamp of approval to whatever methods they're using and, uh, well, conceptual frameworks and then methods to get at those concepts that they're using to, to, break, apart, to break apart those higher level processes. Do you just want to do that or do you have a, do you want to have a, a more general theory about when these kinds of domain specific moves are sort of functioning adequately? Is, mm -hmm. there, a, is there a more general criteria that we could, could, could grow our way toward about, about what makes for good, good composition? Right. Uh, that's an excellent question. I must say I haven't thought about it. Um, I mean, sort of my knee-jerk re reaction would be to say no. Sure. <laughs> I mean, sure. That, 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 <laughs> sure. I mean, it would be to say that there are going to be very abstract criteria yeah. that need to be fleshed out differently for, for each case. Mm -hmm. So you, you will have maybe quality criteria for, for a good neural circuit, which will have to do with uh, its robustness, with... Um, its uh, predictive accuracy and, and um, its conformity with background knowledge, etc., etc. Sure. But these are all, all very vague criteria. Epistemic virtues, basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah, basic epistemic virtues, which, um, which I think are, are important, but they're so on, uh, well, they're so vague. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, how much robustness is enough? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when, yeah. when, when, when doing a sensitivity analysis or something like that, uh, that and, and that's going to be that's going to depend, I think, on the, on the discipline. So each discipline will have standards of sort of quality standards for, for when a neural circuit uh, can be published is, is, is sure. published publishable. Yeah. But but this is going to be highly discipline specific. I guess. I think. Cool. Cool. Thanks. I just have to follow up and use my privilege as a prisoner because. That's the same question, but from the metaphysical point of view. The, the main questions that you will receive by metaphysicians is that if you define a part of relations, you need an individual, a way to individuate the, the host. Mm -hmm. So you need a way to individuate process. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I have to say that your proposition is extremely appealing, mm -hmm. but as a metaphysician, I would say, well, but how do I individuate process to have parts? And that could depend mm -hmm. domain stuff, but hopefully there's some central concept that we should work, mm -hmm. even if there's different specificity by domain, or we're not talking about the same thing at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, here, here you got me, because I'm, I'm not a metaphysician, <laughs> never, never, never was. Uh, unlikely to become one no, but, uh, <laughs> until my it, retirement. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's <laughs> not a problem because the, the proposition is appealing. It's yeah, just yeah. we would like to. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I have been doing some reading on this, and um, I mean, I, I'm of course intuitively uh, drawn to the pluralistic um, approaches that say no, there's no general uh, individuation criterion for processes that depends on the kind of process. So uh, a performance of, of a symphony 
process it doesn't have the same uh, individuation criteria like a um, an action potential in, in the brain. So um, and that that sounds intuitively uh, appealing. I mean, there are, there are proposals about the causal coherence of, of processes. So J James De Frisco. Uh, who uh, is he still here actually? No, he was. He was. At, he was at the other Leuven for a while, but he's. I think he's. Uh, he's oh, it's the other Leuven. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a reasonable mistake. Mistake. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's a reasonable mistake. It's a reasonable mistake. Uh. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, he he has a very interesting proposal um, about processes being individuated by 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 um, the causal coherence. So there are, that, that means that uh, within a process there are more and uh, stronger causal dependencies than between a process and, and its environment. That's, that's, that's one idea and I think that's certainly uh, uh, worth uh, discussing. But um, my sense is that um, this isn't always going to work. I, that's, that's what I fear. So for, for some cases the you, you will you will have um, you will have a different um, have to use different integration criteria. So pluralism about processes, but also pluralism about or perhaps promiscuous realism about the decomposition of processes into natural parts, because uh, ultimately that's that's what we are talking about when when we ask well what are the real constituents of a mechanism? We, we want to know what are the natural parts of a, of, of a process. And um, process, there, there may be many ways of, of, of carving up a, a process into natural parts. Um, so uh, some kind of, um, and there, there may be, there may all be good. So, so some kind of promiscuous realism about processes and decomposition of processes uh, would, would be my, my answer. But maybe this, this doesn't make sense metaphysically. Or, um, at least there are at least some respected metaphysicians who, who, who would accept that. Peter Simons, for example, I spoke to thinks that's yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And he's a metaphysician. So. <laughs> Peter first, Karen, if we have time. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. Uh, quite sympathetic to the proposal, but I have some question that's quite similar to Alexander's question, uh, but about this neurological relation. Um, so, if you say that the phenomenon, um, uh, that the activities are, are, are parts of the phenomenon, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether the activities are wholly constitute the phenomenon, or whether there is still something else than the activities uh, above uh, to, to constitute the full uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and I'm concretely thinking about um, the examples you gave, like the, the watch. Um, uh, or the behavior of the worm. Uh, in the two cases, it seems that you have to add something uh, above the, the wheels, the, the mechanism, specifically the activities of all the things happening in there, to get to something quite complex like measuring time. I mean, there's, uh, uh, in the case of the watch, uh, uh, you didn't mention time for the activities, and then all of a sudden, there's a very complex uh, notion of measuring and time and so on that that's partly is, 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 is subjective. I mean, it's for us that we're that it has this function, but maybe not from an objective point of view. Um, so there seems to be an element added. If it's a neurological relation, then the just the parts do not seem to, the, the activities themselves do not seem to be enough to get to the whole. Um, and the same for the worm. I mean, uh, uh, you have these neural processes, but to, to, to look at uh, the behavior of the worm, you have to first, there is like an added step of realizing uh, that there is an organism, first of all. I mean, you might be blind to the fact that there is an organism at all, um, uh, <clears throat> and still recognize that there are all these neural processes and uh, the cells uh, uh, behave in a certain way, but that there is an organism that is uh, the result of all of this, seems like an extra step. It, it's, uh, it is uh, 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 metaphysically costly, or logically costly, to, to go to the, the behavior of a complex uh, uh, individual. And so from there, if that is true, that it's not purely a, a whole constitution relation, but that you only have parts, uh, um, could the pluralism lie in this, in this thing you add? 
which will always be the same in different disciplines, right? Uh, in the case of, 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 of measuring time, it's more like a, uh, an epistemological factor you add. In the case of, of, of methodology, it's, it's a factor of uh, recognizing that there is uh, an intentional being with some properties and so on. I mean, that could be different to all disciplines, and that could maybe be the stuff that makes uh, the manipulability relation also uh, domain dependent. Would that make any sense uh, in, in your view? So the, the, the extra stuff. <coughs> yeah. That, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what extra stuff you have in mind. I mean, I mean, of course, Processes will have many properties. So, uh, for, first of all, I mean, science is typically interested not in individual token processes, but in types. Mm -hmm. So, neuroscientists are studying a type or types of processes, types of activities. Uh, they do this, of course, by uh, experimenting on token. Uh, processes, but the, the goal is to, to, to study type. Now, now, of course, you can have in the same type, you can have processes that uh, are manifested quite differently in different, in different uh, instances. And that's also why I uh, have a tendency to, to, to call the activities essential parts. That, 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 that those parts that are essential for the process being of that type. So you, you will have uh, non-essential properties in uh, the uh, in any in individual instance of, of a process and, and, and those are not part right. of, the, of, 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 of the mechanism because they are not um, they don't serve the explanatory goals they're not relevant with respect to the explanatory goals now is that part of the pluralism possibly but I, I would seek the pluralism at a more now I'm going to say the, the terrible word fundamental uh, <laughs> level uh, of um, individuation of processes, the thing, kind of things that Alexandra mentioned. Indiv individuation criteria and uh, part parthood criteria. So the um, decomposition principles. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's, that's where uh, the, the deeper explanation, if there is one, could be found for this domain. Uh, specificity, specificity of uh, constitution. Okay. Short question. Okay. Um, so you, I know you're friends of uh, Florizan, and so when you talk about causation, immediately sound you think there's a domain neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget your word. causal method or causal causation. Uh, what, can you say a little bit about that? principles. Yeah. Principle. Reasoning, reasoning causal right. principles of causal reasoning. Right. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more why you um, sign up a position to think uh, there are domain uh, neutral causal reasoning principles mm -hmm. if you are friends of proofs? Right, yeah. Well, there are exceptions <laughs> to pluralism. Uh, no, I think, um, I mean, with, by domain neutral. Uh, causal inference principle. I mean things like you know Mill's method of difference and its its modification. So the idea that when you uh, just change one factor in an experiment and leave every, everything the same, then you can infer that whatever changes is an effect of that and so on. So so this kind of very of very general uh, causal inference rule, which which is used. Um, I mean the whole causal graph theory, uh, which can be applied to v wildly different things. I mean to to uh, the economy of a nation as well as to uh, uh, an ecosystem or uh, um, a human brain or an individual cell. There are things going on that you can study by using causal graph theory as a, as a tool. So in that sense, it's the main it, it's the main domain neutral. But you think causal graph theory a model is <coughs> a theory or a tool? It's a tool. It's a tool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, the causal graph is a, is a tool. Okay. I would say used to 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 study uh, 
well, na natural, the natural world. <laughs> yeah. And the social world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.